Great. Okay, well, uh, welcome uh, to everybody. My name is Paul Snooks, and I'm um, giving the, uh, this presentation tonight about uh, making space for nature in our gardens. Uh, I'm uh, the chair of Worcester Environmental Group, and we've been invited by platform uh, to talk to um, uh, the customers and em employees. Um, you're most welcome to uh, put uh, uh, to in the chat. You're most welcome to um, uh, say who you are now, um, uh, if you'd like to do that. Uh, where's the chat on mine? Here we go. So yes, if you'd like to just uh, write in the chat and just say uh, where you're from. Um, so from, I hope you can see that. So happy to have, uh, I'm a rent officer from Platform. Thank, nice to, nice to uh, have you here, Daisy. Thank you. Okay, welcome to you. To Donald. Don Nurse, sorry, not Donald. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd put my camera on for a few minutes. That that helps. You're definitely not a Donald. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, and there's Rajiv, a customer service advisor. So that's great. Good to have you all here. Hopefully, we'll have more people turning up. As I said, I'm Paul Snooks. Um, uh, I'm the chair of uh, Worcester Environmental Group, been invited by Platform uh, to give this talk. We've started working with Platform uh, on the, uh, their properties and land here in Worcester uh, to uh, increase the biodiversity uh, and to benefit the um, uh, your, your customers. Um, and uh, we've also got uh, your customers and your staff coming to make uh, bird boxes and bat boxes and hedgehog houses and things in a community workshop with us. So um, we were invited to, to do this. So here we go. Um, so uh, let me find, here we are. Right, so make space for nature in your garden. Um, our charities focus very much on the biodiversity emergency. There's a lot of focus on climate change, as there should be. And there's the COP26 uh, at the moment in Glasgow, and, and there's uh, a lot of focus on that. But actually, there's another uh, a huge uh, uh, emergency, and that is uh, biodiversity. It's crashing all over the world. I was just talking to Rajiv um, about um, his experience in Kenya where uh, the wildlife there is plummeting. Um, and uh, the UK um, uh, is, uh, it's already plummeted, I'm afraid, um, but we can do some, there's things we can do about it. The UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. That was some international finding recently. However, we can do something about it. Our gardens combined are bigger than all the national parks in the UK combined. And I'm gonna show you um, uh, something really interesting in a moment. So imagine if all of those gardens, all of us did just one small thing, what a, a huge difference uh, it could make. So uh, let me move on to the next slide now. I don't know if any of you, is, is there anyone here from Worcester? I'm not sure. Um, this is uh, one of the most uh, densely built up areas in Worcester. And ironically, it's called the Arboretum. I think there's one tree at the end. Um, <laughs> uh, I think it used to be an Arboretum before, the, uh, before all these houses were built. And I think, I think you'd all agree looking at that, that mm, I don't think there's much that we can do. There's a little bit of greenery here and there. However, I'm going to give you quite a surprise. And I like to do this little trick when, when uh, I talk, give presentations in Worcester because uh, this is the image everyone has of the Arboretum. I'm now going to show you an aerial view of that very same uh, street view that I've just shown you. Look at that. 
look at all those gardens, look at all those green spaces there. There's, uh, so the photograph was taken uh, around about here, uh, looking up this way, and it looks pretty desolate. But look, look at all these gardens everywhere and, and all these green spaces. And on top of that, here's the railway with the embankment. Railway embankments are a great highway. Um, one of the big problems that nature has is that there are not um, enough highways for uh, nature to travel. So for example, certain native bees uh, can only travel about 300 meters before they need to refuel. So if there's nothing within 300 meters, they can't move uh, and, uh, uh, and then they interbreed and, and, and uh, their numbers drop. So there you've got all that greenery uh, in our gardens, a fantastic opportunity to create a, a, a little bit of space in each of those gardens. Uh, for nature. It then joins up with the railway. Uh, you've got the canal here, and then you've got some allotments. So you can see very quickly how uh, our gardens can connect and, and make a terrific wildlife corridor in a very uh, crowded uh, and um, tarmac and brick uh, environment like that. So Let's have a look at some of uh, the things we're going to be talking about uh, today. Um, so uh, you can, let's see what we can pick out here. Hedgehogs, they, they, they are possibly going to go extinct in Britain. Their numbers are plummeting and there's something we can do an awful lot. Uh, in, in our gardens to, to help them. And uh, we'll be looking at detail with that. Uh, here you've got your wildlife pond. I'm gonna go to in, in a bit more depth with all of these, um, uh, most of these a little bit later on. Um, uh, no doubt you've all, all heard of no mo may. Um, why not make it a no mo summer? Um, um, I could tell you some really interesting things, uh, some of the opportunities there. Uh, uh, what else have we got? We've got birds, we've got butterflies, your bug hotels, uh, uh, your, um, here's a bat box. Um, you'd be very surprised with these bat boxes. They, they enter at the bottom here of a one, meet, one centimeter slit. Um, That's how small uh, the, 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 the bats are. Um, it's quite astonishing. I'll be, uh, look at that little creature there, the little highway, that, that's your hedgehog highway. If you can persuade your neighbors to, to, uh, to have a little hole in, in their fence to connect all your gardens and so on. So we're gonna be talking about uh, all, all, many of these uh, different options that you can see here, hedges. I, saw, I read a brilliant article this morning in, in, in The Guardian uh, um, there was a guy in Devon who studied an 18 meter stretch of hedge for, I think it was several years and found 2000 different species that you, that you could actually see with your eye that he wasn't using a, a, a microscope or anything. So, you know, there's, a, you know, if any of you've got uh, gardens where you could put in a hedge, what a difference that would make. Uh, so let's move on to uh, some of the details. Um, size doesn't always matter. Um, this is my front garden. And it's what, a couple of meters. And um, I've gone really wild here and got a little wild patch. Um, and guess what hopped out of there the other day? that nice little frog. Um, and so uh, uh, people often think that frogs just spend their whole life uh, in, in ponds, but uh, they, they spend an awful lot of time in, in uh, places like this, uh, long grass and, 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 and places where they can stay away from predators. Um, Monmouthshire, the county of Monmouthshire in Wales has this wonderful slogan, nature is not neat. And um, I don't know if, if uh, platform housing start uh, stomping on, on, on uh, well, I'll rephrase this. Do they start um, telling, uh, telling off the, their customers if they're 
gardens aren't neat and tidy. I don't know. I mean, it'd be interesting to see what you say in the any of you in in in, in the chat. Um, but um, there's a perfect example of you don't need to have a large garden. You could even have just a balcony um, and, and, and uh, do something to help nature. Uh, let's move on to helping hedgehogs. Um, there's some simple little things you can do uh, for hedgehogs. Uh, a hedgehog house. Um, you can see there the hedgehog uh, it needs to have a tunnel to protect uh, from from foxes or, or, or dogs uh, and, and cats and, and so forth. Uh, and this is uh, something the Wildlife Trust uh, a design. You can make it yourself relatively easily. Um, uh, you, sh uh, you should have uh, some um, uh, pl plastic sheeting over it and then cover it with leaves and bracken and, 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 and uh, uh, twigs and things like that and put it in a quiet corner of your garden. And you just go and look up uh, Hedgehog Plans uh, Wildlife Trust and, and you'll, you'll find that. We make a lot of these. We're very, very lucky in, in Worcester Environmental Group. We have access to a community workshop with all big boy and big girls power tools and we get all these retired engineers coming along and and uh, rolling their eyes and tutting at me because I'm not an engineer um, but we make uh, we make all these kinds of boxes and bat boxes and bird boxes um, these on you see these in uh, you see these in uh, in stores but what I'm pointing at here now they are not a great idea um, uh, they're not safe from predators. Um, uh, I've heard of um, uh, hedgehogs getting their spikes caught in them and starving to death and so forth. So they're not, uh, you know, I go to a reputable, go to have a, a, a good search online and you'll find some really good information. This is an interesting one. Whoop, sorry, I've gone, I, I've just clicked on the, let's go back. Um, so this is a, a hedgehog feeding station turned upside down. So you'd put your food here so that the, uh, the cats and other uh, and foxes can't get at it. But the hedgehog can go in through this entrance, come around here and, 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 uh, and eat their food uh, undisturbed. And what food should the, can you give uh, hedgehogs? There's some fairly uh, simple information, meat-based cat or dog food, specially made hedgehog food, which is quite expensive, or cat biscuits. There's your hedgehog, hedgehog highway. I've got one in my back gate um, uh, to allow uh, hedgehogs uh, to come in. It needs, uh, you don't need the fancy thing, of course, uh, on there. Uh, it needs to be 13, at least 13 centimeters by 13 centimeters. Um, hedgehogs roam for miles every night. Um, so it's really, really helpful for them to have access to your gardens. So if you could get, ac get give access to a hedgehog in your garden by a simple little thing, you can, if you've got, if you've got those concrete, I don't know what you call them, you, you have the fence, mm. fences with the concrete plinths at the bottom, uh, you can actually get them now with a with uh, you could buy the concrete plinth with a hole for the uh, uh, for the hedgehog highway for the hedgehog to access your garden and talk to your neighbours see if you could if they would mind having um, a, 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 a hedgehog a hole highway in their fence as well. People love hedgehogs, so most people are, are very keen on that. Don't have um, slug pellets. They're really, really, really bad news for, um, oh, there's Paul Edwards. <laughs> uh, he's the chap, Paul Edwards from, I don't know how many of you know Paul Edwards. Hello, Paul. Um, uh, <laughs> so uh, slug pellets are a disaster. Um, the the, the uh, hedgehogs eat the slugs that have been poisoned by uh, the slug pellets that kills the hedgehogs. Um, the, it's really interesting. We're doing quite a lot of work with allotments in Worcester. 
and we got a speaker from Newton Abbott in Devon, who is the chair of the Allotments Association in Newton Abbott. They have uh, uh, allowed every allotment holder to have 25% of their allotment plots turned over to nature. And uh, they no longer need slug pellets because there are no slugs, because there are so many hedgehogs there now that they're eating, uh, uh, eating all the slugs. So uh, that, that's really good news. Um, and here's a simple little thing. Uh, hedgehogs need water. Just have a, a little pot, a little tray like that for them to drink uh, at night as well. Okay, let's move on to, to birds. Now then, I want you to put in chat, uh, how many caterpillars do you think the, uh, the, the blue tit eat, needs to feed each of its fledglings in a day? Just put in, in the chat, how many, how um, many, uh, how many, just guess, go, go mad, be wild, get, get, guess something really stupid. <laughs> how many, just put it in chat there, how many? Donna's gone really wild and sick. <laughs> yeah, but they do fly in and out all the time, don't they? They do, they do indeed. 120. Well, in a dozen, says uh, uh, Rajiv. Actually, they need 100 caterpillars per, per fledgling per day. Wow. So... Um, you can see how important that is. It's very interesting. We have a, a professional ecologist um, on our steering group who uh, advise us and steer us. We've got a, a, an RSPB uh, guy. And at the end of May, he checked all his uh, tit box, uh, boxes, uh, bird nest boxes um, in a nature reserve near Worcester. And 75% of the fledglings were dead. Um, and uh, a lot of that is because there's just not enough food for uh, for, for the uh, for the fledglings in that particular case. Uh, bird bath, bird bath. Isn't it joyous when you see birds in a bird bath? It's just wonderful seeing them. You know, it's just just a, a great experience. Have one just outside your window and watch them. That's fantastic. Um, this this picture. Oops, sorry, I keep doing this. I must stop that. This picture here. Um, this, I took this from the RSPB uh, website today. I, uh, do a Google search for RSB, RSPB uh, uh, food, uh, bird food, uh, and it's just astonishing the range of, of uh, food that you can give for, for different types of birds. Uh, you know, we tend to just think of, very, of a very narrow range of birds. Um, and on that topic, um, if you're interested in making your own, uh, if any of you are interested in DIY, um, uh, then uh, this, book, this book that I'm pointing at here is absolutely fantastic. We use this all the time in this community workshop uh, to, make, um, to make boxes. And we've got a platform uh, housing group coming on uh, Friday uh, to help make these. There's about 40 plus different types of nest boxes that you can make. Everybody thinks uh, to make a little tit box, which is very sweet and very nice, um, but actually um, uh, there's a, uh, the, the, the birds of all kinds are, are, are struggling. And so, you know, tr try and make um, uh, other boxes as well. And here's an example. This is a, a Swift box that you can, uh, uh, Swifts are really struggling for nest box nest sites these days. So um, there's an option. Sorry, would robins go in a box? Yeah, robins go in a, uh, what, an open box. Um, so uh, well, I'll just come out of this for a second. Let me just come out of that and I'll show you a robin box. Robin box. Um, and what you should do with a robin box is put it in ivy or uh, uh, climbing things like that. Let me just go to the images for you. Um, so uh, this is this is this is the kind of box that you'd have for a robin. So they clearly been so exposed and so open 
uh, you'd need to have that uh, uh, put somewhere in scrub or or or, um, mm. or in um, uh, climbing ivy or, or things like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, and there's three or four different birds. Uh, the wren also nests in a box like that. I showed you that picture earlier of my um, of my uh, front garden. I had a wren grow, uh, nesting right beside our front door in the ivy that was growing up the wall. Um, so ivy is brilliant. Um, people think ivy is terrible stuff. It wrecks the house and and it destroys trees. None of it's true. Just do a quick search um, and you'll find that actually ivy uh, really isn't this big enemy that everybody thinks it is. Uh, let's continue with it on with the show. Uh, let's go over there. Um, so yeah, somewhere for them to... Uh, here's another one, healthy soil. Um, I put um, about one or two inches, two to five centimeters of home produced compost on top of my soil every year. And I don't do any digging. It's the rock, most horrible, hard, uh, soggy clay uh, in my garden. But since I've been put in, just put in a couple of inches of, of um, uh, home produced compost on top, it's turned into the most friable, beautiful soil because the worms come up and, and bring all that stuff down in, in, into the soil. And guess, you know, your blackbirds and things like that absolutely love all those big juicy worms and the robins uh, and so forth. So healthy soil uh, is really important too. Um, okay, here's another trick question for you all. Um, what percentage of uh, carbon is held in the soil compared to the percentage of carbon that's held uh, in the plants, trees, jungles, grass, everything, anything that grows above the soil. What, what percentage of the carbon do you think is held in the soil? 10%? What do you think? 80, no, oh, Daisy's gone wild there. She says 80, 89. Um, any other, anybody else? Has it a guess? 45, right. It's actually, Daisy's not far off. It's about 80%. 80% of the carbon um, uh, that we, we have uh, terrestrially uh, is, uh, um, is in the soil and not, uh, and only 20% in the trees and everything. It's astonishing that, isn't it? It's absolutely incredible. So healthy soil is really important. It holds tons of carbon, right and lots of things for, for the birds to eat. Just a minute, where am I? Right, uh, for in, invertebrates, uh, there's been a colossal drop in the number of invertebrates that we have uh, in the United Kingdom now. When the invertebrates go, everything else goes. I gave you that tragic example of 75% of the of the um, uh, blue tits and great tit foxes, were, uh, the fledglings were all dead. Uh, without the invertebrates, everything else up the food chain goes. Um, so they're really, really, really important. And here's some uh, ideas for you um, of uh, how we can encourage more invertebrates into our garden. So um, if you've only got a small garden, which is all I have, climbing plants, a vertical, going up vertically, uh, can be a, a very uh, easy win. Um, if, you, if you've got a bigger garden, put native trees. For example, the oak tree has uh, hosts thousands of native species, separate uh, native species. Um, Trees that are uh, introduced often don't have uh, many, uh, many native species on them at all. Um, so consider, go to the uh, Woodland Trust. I mentioned about uh, hedges uh, to you earlier. The wood, if you have got a bigger garden, uh, the Woodland Trust uh, 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 
sell or give away um, uh, hedge saplings for you to plant your own hedge. Uh, here in Worcester, we're, we've got 250 meters coming in January of edible hedges. Uh, um, so that will be uh, berries that the, uh, that the birds can eat over the winter to get them through, through the winter. Things like um, uh, hawthorn berries, um, blackthorn, and also known as slow berries, for those of you who are fond of slow gin, um, uh, and a rose hip, uh, and then earlier in the year you get your elderberries and, and things like that. So fantastic. And as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, this research done by someone over several years, 2,000 different species uh, visible to the eye uh, in a hedge. So hedges are uh, fantastic if, if you get that opportunity. Um, there, you, there you've got your bee hotel. Um, go to bug life, bug life, if you want to find out about the best type of bug hotel to get. Uh, we also make them uh, here in Worcester. Um, if, if any of you are local and want to come and join us or donate to get one. Um, things like this, this brick wall where there's lots of cavities for, for, for the bugs to go in. Um, I want, can I show you, uh, I if I could show you this photo. I want to show you a photo and tell you an astonishing story if I can find it. Um, I find it. We, um, regarding the, the mini meadow, um, we persuaded Worcester City Council, and they were terrified, we persuaded them to give us a 50 meter experimental stretch of grass verge that had been like a billiard table for 25 years. Uh, and we persuaded them to uh, uh, let, let us manage it in a way that wild, wildflowers would flourish. And we didn't plant a single flower. And this is, I'll show you this now. Let me show you this. All that, all that they, they do now, they cut and collect twice a year. They collect uh, in, uh, August, they cut the grass, or in this case, the wildflowers, take, take it away and then cut it once more in the spring. And that's, that was like a billiard table for 25, 30 years. But when you cut the grass and leave the grass cuttings on there, it feeds the grass and it, it adds to the fertility and more grass grows. If you take away the grass cuttings, take them away, it reduces the fertility and it's counterintuitive, but those flowers that you look at, are looking at there, those are the flowers that flourish in a low fertility environment. So all you would have to do um, on a patch of your lawn is to just do this regime of cutting and collecting um, uh, on a uh, uh, once in the uh, late July, early August, uh, that sort of time. Uh, and take all the cuttings away, put them in your compost heap. Um, and, and, and that's what, um, that's literally what happened. I know it's astonishing, but that is what happened uh, when, when we um, persuaded the city council. It's been so successful, they're now going to be doing it over the whole of the city. People love it. Uh, mm -hmm. They were terrified that the voters would burn down houses and, and turn over cars and the earth might start spinning. But I'm exaggerating ever so slightly, but they were really scared. That's the point I'm trying to make. Um, and, and, you know, you might, people might be worried, uh, what will my neighbors think when they look over and, and see um, things looking messy in, in my garden. Um, but actually when you explain to people, people absolutely love it. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, ponds. Um, a wildlife pond is very different from a fish pond. Uh, you generally don't have any fish in a, in a wildlife pond because the fish 
eat all the all the all the wildlife uh, in there. So um, it's different from a, a fish pond. And again, you can do a quick search: wildlife garden pond, and you'll find lots of uh, really uh, useful information. Uh, I'd recommend having um, uh, uh, doing uh, it this way using um, uh, a liner. Uh, and you can uh, line this with, um, um, you can have an underlay underneath that, have some sand uh, underneath that. Uh, and it's important to have a shallow end for, uh, for creatures to get in and out. If you're, if you're uh, things like um, uh, the hedgehog fall in there and can't get out, they're going to drown. Uh, lots of native plants uh, on the edges and around uh, the pond and also floating plants. And again, a very quick Google search, go to your local garden center, get, get native stuff, because that's whereas those are the things that our, um, that our own native species uh, have flourished on over millennia. Um, and what a joy it is to have a, 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 um, a pond in your garden. Um, you, you then get the most amazing species at all. And what's Paul saying there? Platform and looking at areas that can be rewilded. So if any of you know areas that belong to us, you'd like to see rewilded, please let us know. Yay. That's good news in the chat. Um, and finally, uh, there's a couple of really useful links. If you look at Wildlife Trust, uh, gardening, there's lots of really informa useful information there. And um, also our website gives uh, lots of uh, useful information. Uh, I can, if I can put the, can I put those? I think I can, I'll put these in chat for you. So there's our website with um, lots of ideas for you. And here's the, so we're coming up to the question time now. So uh, I, I thought I'd only whittle on for about, half an hour. Uh, there's a couple of links for you to, to have a, a look at. So I'd be very interested uh, to know what your experiences have been and also what your thoughts are, uh, any questions that you have, uh, fire away. You can either put them in text or you can uh, go ahead and, and, uh, and, and speak whatever you like. I, uh, Paul, um, if, if I can uh, come here uh, and mention some things to you <clears throat> of course i mean my garden is just as as a big garden like we saw in the diagrams you showed us uh, there is a, a bird bath which uh, we have and there is a bird house as well i mean we started putting some feed you know for the birds on in the bird bird house but then come across a friend who said Oh, do you know this is going to attract rodents? Mm. And we stopped doing that. Now, yeah. I've got a plum tree and I've got an apple tree as well, you know, which, uh, of course, brings its own kind of, uh, you know, uh, animals, you know, um, bugs, bees, you know, flies and uh, moths as well. Mm. Uh, the moths have unfortunately killed my apple tree. Uh, the coddling moth, you know, I tried various sorts of uh, uh, avenues, you know, tried to eradicate that, but didn't. Um, but that's what's putting me off. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I live in a concrete jungle. I'm not in a suburb or anywhere at all. Uh, but that little little sanctuary which I've got as my back garden, you know, there 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 are things that are, you know, restricting me to. To look at these uh, little creatures, you know, which, which we should be appreciating. But okay, uh, what's your view to that? Point. So, you know, that's a common uh, concern that a lot of people have. You put out bird feed, and then you get rodents, yeah. uh, get rats coming in. Uh, I, I assume you're talking of rats there, Rajiv. Yeah. 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 That's right. Um, has anyone got any um, experiences, thoughts uh, on that? I did do, I used to have, I had an old tree that we had to chop down because it died and we put a platform, you know, like a base on it 
and I started putting bird seed on there and I came out one night and there was the most massive rat sat on the top of it and it wasn't bothered I was I was I was sat I was stood at the door and I was it's not very far away and it, it, so I did stop doing it because of that as well so I have experienced the same thing so mm. I need my birds in a thing now you know up in a tree yeah so uh, do, you, do, you, do you get the food coming down onto the floor or? Uh, do you... Yeah, but yeah, but it's not, I used to kind of put a big mound in the middle, you know, for them and it's not like that anymore. Mm -hmm. Anybody else got any experiences or thoughts about this problem that Rajiv's just raised? Oh, I can say, you know me, I can say I'm bird, bird mountains. So uh, I feed the birds all the time. And, and uh, it, do you get rats in your, in your garden? I've never had a rat from the bird feed, but I tend to, I could probably not overfeed. Yeah. I will say some people, as soon as they see the bird feeders are empty, they'll go and top it up straight away. Yes. You know, if there's some quite a bit on the floor, I will leave it for a day or so. Mm -hmm. the birds will pick it up off the floor so they're cleaning it self-cleaning if you see what i mean gotcha yeah because it's the excess that attracts vermin i'm not saying you're not going to get it because obviously mm -hmm. depends where you live mm -hmm. and say but they reckon you're never more than eight feet from a rat anyhow mm -hmm. eight, eight, eight meters yeah uh, so it's just the way you manage it really and also you know it's like an else if you if you try and be a bit more cleanly with the seed and bit you know, you should self uh, mm. uh, score itself. Interesting. I've 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 uh, been in forums reading exactly this debate. You know, and some people seem fairly relaxed about having rats in their garden. Um, they're a creature like uh, anything else. I, I think. Um, the, what what's there is a potential of of in their urine isn't there? I, I yeah, it's wheels, isn't it? Right, um, wheels disease. So I'm I, I'm not clear in my own mind what you can do to mitigate the risk because I mean there must there must be rat as Paul just said that they they they're only several feet away at any one moment mm. so they must be in our gardens even if we don't feed um, uh, so. I suppose if you if you wanted to have the uh, bird feeders, then perhaps um, elevation as high as possible, because then that would reduce the amount of seeds and feed bird food that drops. Because it's obviously the seeds and the feeds uh, that attracts um, the rats. So if it's elevated, if you can access it on the branch, if you've got a overhanging tree in your garden. This mm. is a suggestion for the, the man that mentioned it. And you can you could perhaps put your bird feeder, you could elevate it as high as possible. Mm. Um, and then that would reduce the amount of seeds and feed that drop on the, the ground. And then obviously it wouldn't be such an attraction then to, to rats and wood mouses, etc. But you also need to look at what birds you're attracting and what you're trying to attract into the garden as well, because Obviously, if you've got a lot of goldfinch around, Niger seed is uh, the place to go with goldfinch, but it's not going to really attract rats. That's because they're even so hard to see. I think I, I have a real problem with some of the wheat uh, feed. There's a lot of that does get wasted onto the floor. So it's picking the right mix and knowing what birds you're feeding as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I generally find 90% of my bird feed it turns out to be squirrel uh, feed yeah. <laughs> uh, and i've tried every trick in the book uh, I've, I've i've hung it on the washing line and and after two weeks they figured out how to do that what do they call it the marine <laughs> whatever they call that uh, and and then i put a plastic bottle for it to spin um uh, and they figured that one out so i've I just uh, I've gone along with my wife now. Says let's feed the squirrels as well. I can give you a tip on that, Paul. I'm gonna say I got this from the Wildlife Trust. I've never tried it, but apparently it works. Is uh, put chili chili powder in the bird feed. 
It didn't uh, work. I tried that with my, um, it never worked at my previous <laughs> address. I tried, I tried using actual chili seeds. Someone said, get the chili seeds. So you basically <laughs> get the chili pepper and then you scrape out the seeds. They said, you can put that. And I used that and the squirrel just came along and just ate the seeds and just ate them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've given up actually. I just, just go along with it now. I mean, if it was red squirrels, uh, the native red squirrels, that would be less, um, I, I'd be quite pleased, but um, mm. we don't have them. Certainly, has anyone got red squirrels mm. in their neck of the woods? I don't know where people have, uh, are all mm. from here exactly. But yeah, so um, there we are. Um, that, thank you for that point, Rajiv. Uh, would anybody else like to raise any questions or, or, or bring up anything? Any? Yes, I would. Um, we live uh, in the communal garden. And so it's divided in two sections. And um, I've been trying to encourage people to sort of embrace nature. And I think for White's Court, uh, embracing nature really is just sort of like a very preliminary stage, like with just using shrubs. So the most that we're doing at the moment is just like butterflies. But I mean, I was thinking that perhaps we could expand that um, and do more shrubs that can attract butterflies. But the edible edge that you mentioned uh, I think that's a brilliant idea. And there are a couple of spots, uh, corners in our communal gardens that perhaps we could put uh, an edible, we could grow an, ed an edge. Sounds edge. great. If, yeah. if you look up uh, Woodland Trust edible hedge uh, saplings, uh, they, 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 um, they make them available at either, they, I think they give them away free to households, do they? They certainly do to charities, I'm not sure. Does anyone know? Not sure. Sorry, so that's Wood, Woodland. Woodland Trust. Woodland Trust. Yeah. Edible Edge. Edible Edge, yeah. Okay. okay. I think the bird bath as well is a good idea because um, on the one side of the, because we've got like four blocks on one side and then four on the other. Um, and obviously we could accommodate a bird bath uh, on each section of our gardens. Great, sounds good. Uh, in, uh, w when it's a communal garden, it's. I wonder if it has parallels to our experience. I mentioned about this Dugdale Drive uh, where we've got this uh, uh, verge that the council gave us permission uh, to, to um, uh, manage in a way for wildflowers to grow. And I, I thought we'd have a lot more op opposition that, uh, that we'd had people saying, oh, no, the, the residents like it to be neat and tidy. But my experience has been when you say to people, well, we can carry on having it like a billiard table or uh, uh, we can have uh, it like, like it is now be, uh, and have more wildlife, more birds, more bats, more bees, more butterflies. And when you put it like that to people, I've been astonished at the response. People say, hmm, yeah. They, 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 and and, and uh, they've been really positive about what we've done. So, um, you know, in a communal garden, I think if you put, put it like that to people, um, would you like more bats? Would you like more birds? Would you like more butterflies? Uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, people say, oh yeah, I would like more of those. Cause I think it's plain to see that we're in trouble. You know, the, the, the number of speed. When I was a kid, uh, well, okay. When I was in my twenties as a young adult, I'd drive uh, my car, it would be absolutely plastered in insects. Now I can go hundreds of miles in my car and there's one or two insects uh, at the most. There's been this precipitous drop uh, in the number of insects uh, in Britain, and we can do something in our gardens. And in, in, and as Paul has said, in in um, uh, you, you know the areas that you've got uh, uh, that you you have a lot of public green spaces. I, I'm, other than just Worcester, I'm guessing Paul. Yeah, we were, uh, I'm going to say I'd be interested to know where everybody's from. Actually, but obviously being from platform, just to see which areas that they. are you know, they're interested in. I mean, picking up on uh, Valerie's point is, I mean, she's in an ideal point place with Chapter Meadows very close to her. So she could attract some really nice wildlife into 
Brown White's Court because of uh, you know nature's and uh, closeness to the river and everything else. So yes, it'd be interested to hear where the others are from as well. And actually, there'd be quite a chain of gardens uh, running between those uh, uh, um, where Valerie lives and and the, those. Uh, big green spaces that you've just mentioned. So we've got some, a, a message coming from somebody here. Let's see. I'm from Gloucester. Daisy's from Gloucester. Well, that's interesting. I don't know if you've mentioned it at the start, Paul, because I missed the first couple of minutes, I couldn't sign on. But uh, uh, Paul and myself are talking with the Worcestershire Wildlife Trust about creating corridors into the city, aren't we? That's right. And, and you know, the gardens are going to be an important part to try and use the waterways, gardens, any means we can to try and get wildlife back into the city. Let, let me share my screen with you again, um, just for a moment, uh, to show you um, uh, uh, Worcester. Um, so I... I I shared this with you, uh, this image earlier. Uh, I've done a screen capture of it. I missed it because I was trying to assess, get myself logged in properly. Okay, well, uh, this uh, you're a Worcester lady, Valeria. Yeah? Yes. So it, uh, here's the Arboretum, and you would, the Arboretum, uh, do you know the Arboretum at all? Yes. Yeah, so it, it's pretty, um, and I think I showed this picture of, of uh, the Arboretum. It doesn't look very green, but actually, when you go to uh, the Google Maps, uh, it's astonishing how much green space there is there in our, in our gardens. The opportunities to create wildlife corridors. And as you zoom out, that's that's the least green part uh, of Worcester. And as you start zooming out, look at all these green spaces everywhere. Look at all. Look for example. Look at all these gardens here. Look at all those green spaces. Yeah. So it's not just these nature reserves. Uh, if you hold it there, Paul. Where, sorry, You're saying yeah. that. Do you go back to Gorse Hill in the top corner and see where wrongs were dead, uh, down a bit? Yeah. Do it says Gorse Hill and Albury Mount there. local nature reserve? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can see it. Look yeah. how surrounded that is in by all the estates in Worcester. Would you believe there's actually deer in that wood and it's oh, surrounded wow. by all? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's quite astonishing. And there are, there are deer that have popped up, especially with all the lockdowns, deer were popping up uh, right in the heart of the city. Um, it's just quite remarkable. But look, but look at all look at all these green, it's not just these public green spaces. Look at all the greenery, uh, it, you know, it's just, look at that, you know. If, if well, you've just gone past Holly Mount of, School as pardon? well. Holly Mount School that you've just, on the left of that picture, you've just made two back boxes for. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, just here, up here somewhere. There it is, yeah, there. Yeah, so, and the other thing we'd like to do uh, with with the, the school here is to get a hedge along there. There's a hedge along here. So if I go to, uh, let's go there and go to the street view. Uh, hang on, which way, I'm lost. You need to go up the road, Paul. Oh uh, yeah, I need to go up here, don't I? Yeah. Right. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. And so there's a hedge, really nice hedge, native hedge. Don't always go for a native hedge. Look at that. Look at that there. You know, what an opportunity there there is to have a hedge uh, 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 right along here, for example. And that will go right into that El Elbury Hill Nature Reserve. So you've got your, you've got a highway coming through there and then all those wonderful gardens as well. Right, do we have any more, uh, anything anybody else wants to say or ask questions about? I've just got a question. I've got a couple of frogs in my garden. A couple of frogs? Yeah, I haven't got a pond or anything. <laughs> um, is there anything that I could do to kind of make it more frog friendly. Okay, uh, one important thing, there's two or three things you could do. One of them is to get um, uh, a hibernaculum. I'll write it for you in here, hibernaculum. 
and I'll show you a picture of uh, uh, show you a picture of a hibernaculum. You're probably all doing a frantically doing a. Yeah, I've never heard of that before. So. Well, let me show you. So uh, let me share my screen again. So a hibernaculum is basically, I wonder if I could show you, a, a, ah, let's look at this. See the picture that, there that I'm, I wonder if it, yeah. See this picture here? Yeah. You dig a 50 meter, sorry, 50 meter, 50 millimeter hole and you put uh, 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 logs and brash and things like that. You put uh, a couple of pipes in and then a mound of earth uh, uh, on top and then uh, newts and frogs and toads will go down there and over winter. So that's one. Oh, that you can do. Uh, and there's some examples there. There's, there's one. Uh, let's look at that picture. There you go. That's the in the making. Yeah. So hibernaculum, that, that, that's uh, one option. The other one um, is lung grass in a corner. They're absolutely, you, you, um, you, uh, we do a lot of work outside and you'd be astonished. We've got frogs jumping out everywhere in some of our orchards where we've got lung grass. Have you? Yeah, yeah. Just, I was surprised because I thought they'd need to be near a pond, but they often... No, no, no. They spend There's... most of the year out, out, out of the ponds. They just go, uh, often, they'll often just go in the pond uh, to breed. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so they'll travel quite extensive different uh, distances uh, to um, uh, to spend the winter somewhere. I have got oh, a little log. corner where I'm trying to leave it wild. Yeah, a log pile, piles of stones. Yeah, uh, the, the piles of leaves, um, uh, um, a compost pile, any uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, would be really good uh, for frogs. But if you want to get really fancy, then your hibernaculum would, that, right. would be... Yeah. Uh, I'll have to get my husband to have a look at that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> get him to dig the holes. That's my yeah. wife. <laughs> yeah. Right, thank you. Um, I remember I like to stay still in nature sometimes. And um, because when you stay still in nature, nature comes to you. Um, we're normally crashing around and talking and moving and, and nature just goes pew, pew. and one day I was uh, it was in the winter and I was in a, uh, an old uh, traditional community orchard um, and there was a fox just leaping up and jumping on, on, on the grassy uh, um, the tuss, tuss, tussocky grass just jumping up and landing on it trying to disturb voles and, and, and mice and, and, um, and, frogs yeah. and, and things like that. It was really, and he came right up to me before. Um, and then I looked around the, behind the tree I was standing and ah, he noticed me and ran off. I highly recommend stand, stand, staying still and quiet in nature for a bit. It's astonishing, uh, it really is. And I'm sure you've done it in your garden or somewhere where you're just sitting on, on, a, on your bench or something and just, and suddenly, you know, nature comes right up to you. It's beautiful. Wonderful. Yeah. So yeah, have a little. Yeah, tell you, Paul. Uh, Sorry, uh, Raji. Uh, Paul, what uh, what what I've uh, what I've done in the summer months is uh, like sit down still mm -hmm. and watch uh, the Ant Olympics <laughs> going on. <laughs> you, know, you, you watch these ants, and and they have an Olympics, you know, of their own. <laughs> so it, it's it's quite interesting. I mean, in fact, uh, I, I don't know if anyone up there, maybe Donna or somebody uh, who goes on to Yammer, you'll probably see some of my poems I've written about a wildlife. I've written poems about uh, the leaves that fall down during the autumn. Uh, but I have a, a great interest in watching <laughs> these kind of wildlife as well. Well, actually, it's 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 astonishing when you uh, you can get the uh, what are they called? I always forget the name of them. It's a little magnifying glass, a little round yeah. magnifying glass. Uh, always forget. Uh, Paul, can you help me with this? Right now, so I know that my grandkids have got those with the little pot with the magnifying glasses on the top. Yeah, so and, you can actually look at those. And are pretty good. Just, just get on your hands and knees with one of those, and there's a. It, 
like if you watch ants close up, you know, if <laughs> they're in the Amazon jungle, you know, in the grass and things like that, you know, it's just oh, yeah. a, a, astonishing. Yeah, it just watching the and micro you, world is is just a revelation. And and you see them pick leaves, you know, about ten times their size. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. and yeah. run around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there was a lady in Leicestershire that over several years. Uh, monitored every single species in her garden. I don't know if anyone's heard of that. And there were literally thousands and thousands of individual species that she that she uh, discovered. Um, so and picking up on your point, Paul, about just taking no time for nature, it's like oh, now is a good time because it's amazing. Uh, the last couple of days where I've just actually seen flying around with the migration and everything. Seems to be a big influx of red kites at the moment around the Midlands. Wow. I've seen, I've seen three in the last two days, just in the most unusual places. So. Paul is an avid birder. Could I call you a twitcher or are you not quite no, that No, far? no, no, don't, don't call me a twitcher. <laughs> <laughs> there, uh... Again, but it's like an ounce. If you're just rushing down somewhere, you just say, oh, there's a large bird of prey there. And sorry, yeah. Paul. Yeah, uh, red kites. Uh, sorry, can you? If anyone's got a photo, can they bring up a photo of the red kite? Yeah, here we go. I'll share one with, with you now. The red kite. And the red kites will be using the seven and things like that to actually. They're starting to spread, aren't they? Now they're yeah. beautiful. And, and um, beautiful. they're different from a buzz. The easy way to to see that they're different from a buzzard, which is very common, is they have quite a forked tail. And the wing wing shape's different as well. Yeah. Uh, so the, more... the hook of the wing. Yes. They look quite big. Are they quite? Have you got well, another they're photo? Than a uh, they're about the same size as a buzzard, I'd say, Paul. Wouldn't you? So slightly bigger. Slightly bigger. So if we compare. Well, like you say, it's that great big fork tail that gives them away. There's your buzzard. Oh, you can see they're much smaller. Yeah. Have you got a photo of the, the red kite just sitting, not flying, so I can get an idea what they oh, look like? The... They just sat. I've never seen them sitting. They're always <laughs> the red kite. Let's try. If you're ever if you're ever over in Wales down Raider by the oh. Elon Valley, there's a place called Gigrim Farm. I would oh, recommend it. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. I would recommend it. You will have a, a, a an experience that will stay with you for life because they feed them and over 500 of these birds come in at one time. Wow, wow. that sounds really interesting. Look at that. They, they were saved from extinction in the UK. So, and and I, you're starting... Mm. I, I saw some flying right over the building block um, last year, Paul. Yeah, I, I saw one in, in Warden myself. Yeah, so, uh, Warnden's a quite a sort of big social housing area uh, in the, you know, completely surrounded by other houses and the industrial estates. And there's a kite. Actually, the, I think there were two or three flying, um, cir circling. So. So, oh. so how would we attract a, a, a red kite in our garden? What do they Oh, like? you wouldn't get a red kite in your garden, I'm afraid. You no. 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 It's got they to be like... Persecuted. They were persecuted because they were thought they were taking lambs because they were quite a big bird. They thought they were taking lambs and various other things. They don't, they only feed on carrion. So things off, you know, roadkill and things like that, that's what they're after. Oh. And, and it's strange because they're in the city, they're out in the country now, which is a stronghold, but they're in, in effect, so they're city birds and town birds. They used to fly around, you know, a bit like starlings do. Uh, on, on, on that note, uh, I'll finish on this note. Uh, here's another trick question for you. Would uh, honeybees do better uh, in the centre of London or in the countryside in Worcestershire? Ah. <laughs> London. They do better in the... Because it's a trick question, you know. They do better in London yeah. than they do uh, in, in, in the countryside. The countryside is a, a sprayed and... and, and uh, I call it a green desert, a monoculture and so forth. There's so much more variety for bees to forage on um, in, in, in cities. So, you know, we can do an awful lot in our cities to, to 
uh, enhance uh, biodiversity and, 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 and do great things for nature. And we can start in our gardens with a little patch uh, for our frogs, Donna. Yes. Uh, in, in, <laughs> in, 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 in the corner of your, in the corner of your garden. Um, we've, got two, we've got two raised beds in our garden and I've planted a, a lavateria shrub and I've noticed the bees absolutely love it. They, they're always hovering around it. In fact, when I go to water it, it's as if I'm interrupting their work. It's as if I'm not supposed to be there. You know, what are you doing here? We're busy, you know, go away sort of thing. But yeah, they absolutely do love the uh, lavateria shrub and that can settle and grow quite easily and comfortable. Uh, in the raised beds and which you can easily have in a, a communal garden or any other garden uh, belonging to platform housing. Nice, thank you Valerie. Well on, on that note uh, our hour is up so uh, just like to thank you all very much. Paul just uh, want to hand back to you uh, as you organise this. So yeah, I would be interested in know what you all thought of this talk because there's maybe your plans to do more. What do you think? Interesting. I'm going to get a robin box now. I now I know what to get, and I'll try and sort my frogs out. <laughs> so isn't that fantastic? Someone's <laughs> doing something positive there, Donna, uh, for, for her garden. You know, I imagine think, if, if sorry, millions think... of us did. Imagine if millions of us did just two simple things uh, in our gardens every year. So yes. What an impact that would have in the country. Yeah, I think uh, edible edge. I think that's something that probably work in our garden, getting the small edible edge. Sounds great. Yeah. Can I just say a big thank you to Paul for doing this for us? Because as I said, it came from a conversation we had and there are projects that we're looking at right across the platform area. We know we've got a green strategy that we want to improve and we need to make sure that we're doing things right for nature. Yes, we might not get everything right, but we've got to start somewhere. Uh, and a big thank you for everybody who turned up tonight. Hopefully, Paul uh, will share this video with me later, and I'll put it out, out on uh, social media for others to learn lessons that he talked about. And we can take things from there. But very nice to have met you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye then. Bye bye. Bye bye now.